Well, good morning again, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So since this goes on YouTube, I have to say welcome to Grace Cruise and Fellowship, even though you guys all know where you're at. <laughs> I don't know. But where we're at. Oh, okay. I'm just here. All righty. There. Uh, got a couple things for this week. Uh, all sorts of stuff happening. Uh, of course, prayer. Uh, again, I'll we'll be uh, putting prayer requests out there. Send texts for prayer requests. And if I don't reach you by text, feel free to text me. Uh, keep forget my number. It's on the back of the bulletin there. Uh, and then uh, Friday, we got game night slash Mark's birthday at the church. Yay! Uh, great. Yay, happy, happy almost birthday. Birthday, a pizza, a, a pizza cake and birthday cake will be there. Pizza <laughs> cake. Remember, it's still a surprise party. It's still a surprise <laughs> party for Mark, by the way. Don't let him know. <laughs> and then uh, bring your own beverages. And then Saturday, uh, Richard Memorial at yes. uh, the um, Ryder Remember Memorial, Memorial Park there. So from 1 to 4. And uh, if you have one information about that, uh, I'll have to let you know to call Heather, and uh, if you need her number, I can get that for you. Uh, please feel free, remember, if you have like, some 3 by 5 cards or something, uh, uh, write that down, write down memories of Richard, and then uh, let her have them, that way she can review them. Uh, family camp, just a couple weeks away, almost, uh, and we're going to need a, just... I'll probably send a text out, but also if you know if you're going, please let me know because uh, we're going to be sharing some meals together, and which is always fun. And so we kind of need to know how much fun, yeah, how much fun we're going to have. <laughs> so, how much fun plans. <laughs> and so uh, please feel free to let me know if you're coming or not, and then that way we can gather that information. So within the next week or so, uh, let, let me know if you're coming or not. Okay, and I like I said, I'll probably send a text out inquiring the same. So uh, there you go. Is there anything else going on that, that we need to know about? All right, there we go. All right. On that note, let's pray and get ready to dive into the Lord's word. Father, we just uh, thank you for this morning. Thank you for all you're doing, and uh, we pray now as we get ready to worship you in the Word. Father, uh, as the psalmist said so long ago, open our eyes that we might see wonderful things from your law. And I echo that prayer, Father, because it's so hard to look at these heavenly visions and uh, they're the descriptions that are inspired, uh, but still, Lord, they just, they, we know that they just don't even reach out or, or really help us to fully understand. So I pray, Father, that uh, we would be inspired today by you, Lord, to think about these things, to contemplate uh, the majestic view of heaven in the throne room that uh, Daniel and others have seen. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Daniel chapter 7, blazing on through. With, uh, we're going to hit verse uh, 13 and 14. Uh, today I titled it The Dominating Kingdom. The dominating kingdom. And um, when Daniel has been reviewing this vision so far, we, we, he's seen the four beasts, which are the four different kingdoms that uh, are there that are going to be one that already existed, three more were coming uh, down the line that, that would then become the, the European Middle Eastern kingdoms that we're familiar of. But, uh, he started with Babylon, then he had Medio Persia. Uh, then the Greece, uh, the kingdom of Greece, as they had their influence, and then, of course, uh, the kingdom of Rome. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these guys as Daniel gets his interpretation. Uh, but, of course, we saw that Daniel was fixated on that fourth kingdom. He's really paying attention to that. Uh, and, but then the Lord uh, gets his attention. He's like, oh, D Daniel, I know you want to know about this guy, but... I want you to know who's on the throne. And we had a, a last couple Sundays where we just looked at the Ancient of the Days and him being on the throne and him, what his throne was about. And then he was he was telling of the future judgment that he was going to pull up a chair, if you will, and going to judge 
this fourth beast, especially one that was there called the Little Horn, was the Antichrist. And so in other words, he made Say it, he was going to last week we talked about it. he's saying all sorts of great things, saying blasphemous things against God. And but God will silence him uh, very quickly. And so uh, Dan, Father is now going to draw Daniel's attention to someone even more significant. And so uh, let's read through Daniel 7, 9 through 12 first. Uh, I want to get some context on this. It says, as I looked, and this is Daniel, he's looking, thrones were placed. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. His wheels were burning fire. In verse 10, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Verse 11, I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, that little horn, the, the Antichrist. And as I looked, the beast was killed and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And in verse 12, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So last week when we ended with that, that verse 12, and we talked about that these folks that uh, we're going to be existing and we see them today like especially uh, looking around even the vestiges of the Roman uh, era is all over Europe everywhere and even we have influence from that and from Greece and from others all the governmental influences of the West are all around us still today how we govern how we think our literature everything has all been influenced by these these other governments these other kingdoms and so they're still there but Something's going to happen. He says these guys are let go loose for a time, but we know uh, in Scripture that somebody's going to do something about that. And so that's where the Lord introduces and shows, is going to show Daniel somebody else. And it's kind of interesting. I was thinking about this as a passage just before we get into it. One of the things I, <coughs> as I try to set my filters in Scripture is always to think about how... Is this communicating God's love? Because that's, we always talk about the Bible as God's love letter. Like, how is this communicating it? And I realize that, again, he's about to talk about Jesus. He's about to talk about the Son of Man. And we know that Jesus is the demonstrator of God's love. We talk about Romans 5.8, where God shows or demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. He is the demonstrator of God's love. And so God, to show his love and concern in action, he's already shown action where he's like, and eventually the Father will judge, but how is he going to execute that? How is he going to take the place of all these other kingdoms? Because, see, that's part of our hunger and our thirst. We want to have a relationship with the Lord. How is that going to be possible? How could that happen? And the only way it can happen is if somebody, someone, God in the flesh, was able to relate to us. And so that's what he's about to show. He's about to show how he will take this action, how he will demonstrate it, how he will bring this about for all of us to enjoy a forever relationship with the Father. Now, uh, in Scripture, uh, we see uh, the pre-Christmas pre Christ is, is throughout the Old Testament. He shows up, he's, he's the one taking action. We talked a little bit about right before the Battle of Jericho, when Joshua sees the commander of the Lord's army. So that was Jesus. When Gideon was looking, he's like scared to death, hiding the family grain stores, and the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, showed up, and he's like, hey, you're, I'm here, and this is holy ground. In other words, it was Jesus. He was there and showing himself. 
Some suggest that when, when Abram was there, you know, talking about what it was, he's not even going to have kids and stuff, and then God showed up as three persons there, which is very interesting in Genesis. So he's, he shows himself. He's, he's the, acted, the actor and the enactor of what the Father's will. And we see that in the Gospels. That was the one thing Jesus was always in communication with the Father. All the time he's talking with the Father because he is there to show how to do the Father's will. He was, he was never being independent. He was always enacting like what what the father wanted the son to do because the son was the demonstrator. As I said before, the disciples at the very last night, they said, we want to see the father. What did he tell them? He's like, if you see me, you see who? You've seen the father. Because Jesus was the actor. He was, he was showing forth who the father was and what he was about. And that, that's what he's doing. And so that's kind of what we're seeing in this Faith in Daniel's vision here. So first, he's seeing somebody else and he sees a coronation. At least that's what I'm going to call it. Because it seems to me that's kind of what's happening. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. He says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, in other words, look, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So here we see this term. We see this whole vision. Something's happening. Something's coming with the clouds of heaven. And that seems, whenever you see the cloud, God constantly uses clouds all the time to do things. When the Israel was, it had to be led, led around the desert. And during the daytime, it was a cloud that would move them and fire at night. So they understood that when they wanted to go before Mount Sinai and God was going to give them the command, he shows up in a very scary cloud. And so this cloud is there. Clouds seem to speak of this majestic, mysterious, ethereal stuff. That's, it just, that, that, that's what it pictures. In fact, when Jesus revealed himself and they got to see him transfigured, John, the very one that we were just reading Revelation, he had seen Jesus like that before. And what was there? There was clouds there. And so now we see the cloud of heaven is coming out from this mountain. The cloud is there. Ezekiel talked about the throne room with a lot of the same pictures of that idea. Ezekiel 10.4, it says, And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub, that would be one of the angels, to the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud. And the court was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. So this, this cloud was there, showing the, it, which is just amazing when you think of clouds. I, one of the most amazing things that I think of when I think of clouds is that a cloud up in the sky weighs tons and tons. Mm -hmm. And yet it still flows. It's just amazing. Amazing what a cloud is and what it's about. Now it's kind of interesting. Remember these beasts that Daniel had seen earlier? Where did they come out of? They came out of the sea. This person comes out of the clouds, a different origin, a different place, a heavenly origin. So Daniel was not just thinking about this person and has a descriptive title with him. Daniel 7.13 again, it says, and there came one from in the cloud like a son of man. Now it's a key phrase where he says, like a son of man. Like a son of man. Jesus is fully human, yet this alludes to something in Scripture that Scripture states elsewhere in Philippians chapter 2, where it talks about his humiliation. In Philippians 2 7 says, But he, that be Jesus, empty, uh, but he, he but emptied himself, that himself would be Jesus, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He has this likeness. That he was, and so this likeness is alluding back to this idea, this son of man. It's kind of interesting, the, the, this whole phrase, the son of man, if you're a student of the Bible, if you have your little phrase, a lot of people can do their searches nowadays. If you did a search of that, you would find out that the phrase is used most in one particular prophetic book, and that would be the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is used like 93 times, and it's all 
for Ezekiel. But it's not a it's not a good term, if you will. It's actually it's God constantly reminding him of his humble spot. He's like, you son of man, say this. You son of man, say this about me. You son of man are going to see this. It's a disparaging term towards Ezekiel, not an honoring term. So in other words, here it is, this person that's like a son of man is humble. Of course, this was Jesus' favorite title for himself. Used uh, almost 30 times in Matthew, 25 times in Luke, 15 times in Mark, and 12 times in John. So, it's, uh, But it's used, Matthew and Luke have been the most, and most of the time, it's used by Jesus saying something about himself. So Jesus suggested the title. He was taking hold of this for showing who he was, his humble position. He could have all constantly talked about himself as the son of God. He couldn't have just said that. But he said son of man. Now keep in mind, even the rabbis at that time equated the idea of the son of man with the Messiah because of Daniel and other scriptures pointing towards this Messiah. We're going to read at the very end of this when we get there the, the psalm that talks about the son of man also. Because we're not sure if it, did it start with Daniel or with this other psalm. But here it is. The son of man, this humiliating position that's there. Mark talks about it at the time when, uh, at the very end, when he's at his trial. And it says in Mark 14 that he's, he's being quiet, he's not saying anything, they're demanding answers of him. And Jesus said, but he remained silent and made no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Which they, that's, see, they knew. They knew who the Messiah ought to be. They knew that the Messiah would be the son of God. They just didn't understand what it meant. They just didn't get it. It just didn't equate in their brains. And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the cloud of heaven. So when Jesus is saying this right here, this statement, he's going right back to Daniel. So Daniel had this vision. Daniel had seen this. They wouldn't know exactly what he's talking about. And because they didn't believe him, in their mind, that's, a blasphemous, disrespectful statement towards God. Of course, Jesus backed it up because he, he, he showed who he was. And so, this title is also, we see it, it's kind of interesting. So, Ezekiel is used for him, but elsewhere when it's used, it's uh, generally used as Jesus. He used it to describe himself. He used it whenever he was encountering them. Whenever he had, I would definitely suggest uh, do that study, do a study of the, how Jesus used that phrase, Son of Man, that title. Uh, but significantly, outside of the Gospels, it's only used a couple other times. Once in Acts, when Stephen is there, when Stephen is getting stoned, and he sees the Son of Man. He sees him right before getting killed. He understands that he's there. But the other place is in Revelation, where we were just at, when I was reading just a second ago. And uh, Revelation 1.13, where it says, In the midst of the Lamb stands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash on his chest. And the rest of the description there is describing complete majesty. Whenever it talks about the, God, all these seven lambs, and seven anything is completeness. And that's going to be meaningful down the line when we see what he is about to do and what he does. Remember I called this the dominating kingdom. The dominating kingdom. Well, that's going to that's gonna come into play here in a moment. So he's revealing in the book of prophecy his, his final work. A lot of people don't understand Jesus is going to be about his father's business, which is bringing about the accumulation of the end. There's another, the other spot in Revelation where this is used. I think if Jesus, some could make a, make a case, it might be somebody else. But in Revelation 14, 14, when a harvest is being made, a harvest of the grapes of wrath, 
And it says, then I looked, and that'd be John, he looked, and behold, a white cloud, there's that cloud again, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. <clears throat> about ready to bring about judgment. That's part of his role. Remember, he is the father's enactor. The father's enactor. Making things happen. So Daniel sees that this person is related to, yet distinct from the Father. Remember, we, we believe in the Trinity, that, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so there, even Daniel seeing a distinction between these two, this, this, the Ancient of Days is not this person. Somebody different being presented to it. Because it says in uh, Daniel 7.13 again, it says, And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So, of this relationship, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we, we're going to, if you were looking at the Gospels, again, at Christmas time, we have the messenger of God. Remember who the messenger was? Who was it that told Mary what was about to happen? It was Gabriel. Well, Gabriel, of course, is going to play a part in the book of Daniel. It, it, so, it's kind of interesting. Daniel has this expression, or Gabriel, when he told Mary who it was that she was giving birth to. In Luke 1.32, it says, And he will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. So this is Gabriel talking about something that Daniel had already seen. Because when it talks about he came before the Ancient of Days, that's there, that coming before the Father. He is in there with the Father, but he's being presented to him. If you look at Daniel 7.13 again, it says he's presented. And so this, the idea here is a pre presentation of power, of promotion. He's being promoted to something, which is kind of interesting because he, we know from Scripture that Jesus and John is called the Word. And it says the Word has always been there. In fact, some people suggest that Jesus, before he was the incarnation, would be called the, the Word. From John chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so that idea that he is the eternal Word of God. So he's always been there. So... That's where we come back to this now. When we see Daniel's vision, we have to remember that it's a vision. It's trying to, not just, it's not just a, a guided scenic tour of the throne room. This whole vision is also trying to communicate something. Communicate something about God, communicate something about what he's doing and how he's going to do it. And so that's part of what we're seeing here. Uh, and John, remember with this, this scene, this whole scene, it's like, we're in the throne room, things are happening here, this person is presented to him, and I was, I was like, when I was studying this, I was like, what is going on? What's happening here? And I was just like, I just wasn't satisfied with what I was seeing. You know how when you're just looking at something, and just looking at it, looking at it, and it's like, oh, I can see a little bit of this, and I was just kind of mulling on it. Then it struck me, it's just like that idea, it's just like, he's trying to tell us something. He's trying to show me something. Trying to show us something about what's happening. Then it occurred to me, I had seen this scene before. And the scene is in Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation chapter 5, we, the scene is, they're, they're about ready to undo the scroll. The scroll of, of ownership. The scroll of who owns the earth. It's, it's, it can't be opened. John sees it and they're like, oh, if only somebody can open this. And John is like, he's starting to wail and weep. He's just like, it can't be open. It looks like the very will of God could be stymied. It looks like what the king, the Messiah, could come into wouldn't happen. How did how could it be open? And he's distressed about it. But then he's comforted in Revelation 5, verse 5. It says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and the seven seals. And then this is where it jumps out at me. Verse 6, 
And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out on all the earth. So the horns, remember we were talking about horns, so the horns show rulership. So to have seven horns is speaking of complete rulership. That's his understanding. This guy is completely in charge. This lamb. And he has the seven eyes. He can see everything. He knows everything. That's what he's getting at. And so this is the same scene. This is the idea. This person, this son of man, like the son of man, is being presented before the father. So now he's presenting him. Now we come to what this all means for him. And Daniel has a one-verse summary statement of what it's all about. The idea is there will be no end. There will be no end to this. Because he's given, he then given like a laundry list description about this God. Who he is and what he's about. Daniel 7, verse 14, the very first part of it, it says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. I was like, oh, okay, that's quite a mouthful. What's going on there? And you know, especially since I was wondering, what's the difference between dominion and kingdom? I kind of knew what glory was all about, but what's the difference? Well, a dominion, especially since this, this part of the scripture is still in Chaldee or Aramaic, not in Hebrew. So he's still in, in that. He's using the, the other language. Dominion means empire. Dominance. And power through legal authority. Thus, this person would have, to have an empire is to have expansive authority over all that, that, that you are in authority over. You know, just like when Napoleon had his empire, uh, they, they had the Roman Empire, and wherever the Roman Empire was, wherever their coin was, that was it. Back in the day, the British Empire, they said that the sun never sat on the British Empire because they had holdings throughout the world. So that was the idea, this empire, this expansive authority. He also is given glory. The idea of glory means that deserving of honor and respect. Remember, the, the word glory is up to mean weighty, it's heavy. So it's like to have heavy respect. Like anytime when you run into a situation and you just or run into some uh, person that you know, it's like, okay, this person is of some importance. You have some respect. You wait and think about what you're going to say. So in that kind of this glory, deserving the honor and respect. But then he says he's got a kingdom. The kingdom is to reign over the domain. It's one thing to have an empire, but it's another thing to reign over it. To have a rulership over it. Dominion speaks of power. Kingdom speaks of relationship. And this, of course, for a kingdom relationship could be a good relationship, it could be a bad relationship. Depends on the king. You know, and so that's the whole idea, but it's still a relationship. Anybody could be, there's a lot of people that says, I'm a, you know, I love it nowadays, and, and, and I've seen this for the, a, a little advertisement that uh, if I wanted to spend 48 bucks, I could all become a land of the lord of the land in Scotland or something like that in England. This guy is selling square foot of his land. And so when you would have that, and you would be a landlord over that, and you could call yourself Lord, like you know, Lord Burt, you know, it would be just like Lord Robbie. You know, just like, and I'd have the whole certificate and everything. It's like, oh yeah, that's nice. Whatever. <laughs> but there it is. I would be Lord for that little square foot of land. One of these days, maybe. <laughs> but the whole idea is just like to have that, but you're not king over anything. You have no real authority. And that's what he's getting at. He's communicating just like he has this dominance and he has respect and he has the relationship to do it. He is a king, he's the ruler. But when we think of Jesus, he is a king that's still coming into his kingdom. That's what's kind of interesting. That's what's, it's the, it's the near and far of it. Because that's where, that's the whole idea of the book of Revelation. Is that he is opening up. 
open it up and it's like, okay, now I'm going to take what is mine. What is his? All creation is God's, but right now, in this existence, there's still somebody else here that's causing a whole lot of hate and discontent. And that, so eventually, the Lord will deal with him and take it all back. This is stated uh, very interestingly when Paul has his Athens sermon. He, of course, he shows up and they, he sees that they have all sorts of gods out there. And he's like, oh, okay, you guys have all sorts of gods. And he, eventually in his sermon, he talks about that they had one statue out there to the unknown god. It's like, well, that unknown god, I know who that un unknown god is. He's the god that made everything. And he's talking about what his role will be in Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. He says, for these guys to understand, these, these Greek pagans, if you will, in the times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So here... Paul is very succinctly describing the same idea of authority, why Jesus would have this authority, that he would be a man. He's in the likeness of a man. He's, he's echoing the shadows of what Daniel had to say. The same idea for them. So this, all, see, one of the things is why we talk about, like, the Trinity. I've mentioned this before, but it's always good to think about it, that the Trinity is there, it, there would be no personal God without the Trinity. There would be no personal God without the Trinity. Because he would have no eternal relationship. If it was just a singular God, he'd have nobody to talk to. He had no need to talk to. There would there'd be no relationship. But because he lives in Trinity, he's always had relationship. And thus, as a relationship, it shows everything is personal. Everything is personal. That's the whole idea. We say, hey, God, why are you taking this so personal? Because he is personal. That's part of who he is. It's, it, and I hate using the word part. I was thinking about this the other day. Because we were talking about the idea that this is all, Jesus is the enactor of God's love. And love is not just part of who he is. Love is who God is. But he's also holy. He is 100% love, 100% holy, 100% righteous, 100% omniscient, 100% omnipresent. He's all of those things. And it's so difficult. The human mind just can't take it in. We're always like, no, i got to take up this pie and i gotta, I got to make a different slice. And it's like God doesn't work that way. He is all of that, which blows our mind because we, we have to partition things. In my life, I, I was like, okay, I'm putting on my dad hat now, and I'm going to do this. Okay, I'm going to stop doing that. Now I'm going to put on my work hat. Now I'm going to put on my husband hat. And there he goes. So I partition things, you know, to, to do whatever role I'm in. But God does. He doesn't. He's wearing all the hats all the time. That's what he does. And it's just interesting to think about these because when he speaks of doing the ruling and do being a, having dominion and glory and, and a kingdom, that's all of what a person does. That's a personal thing. Really showing what he's about. And then what's interesting is that he explains why that's so in Daniel 7, 14, the next part of it, where he says that all peoples, nations, and language, languages should serve him. Very interesting. He divides that out. All peoples, all people, every member of the human family, male and female, regardless of ethnicity. That's, the, that's what he's encompassing. Everybody. We're going to do that. Remember that's when we were to look in the book of Romans. We we're wondering why was Paul having all this argument about the Jews and the Gentiles? It's because the Jews just couldn't handle it. They're like, what do you mean Gentiles? We're the people of God. We have this privilege. We should have all this. And there was an argument about it. And Paul had to help them understand that, yes, there's a future. There's, the Jewish nation has this one particular future, but Gentiles are now part of the, of the plan, too. Very interesting. So all peoples, 
you will be the Lord of all people and all nations. So every person, regardless of what part of the planet they were born on. That's the whole idea. Just like, like well, it's just this country, not that country. It's just all the people here, not over there. No, he's saying everywhere. Everywhere, all nations. He will be in charge of all nations. And again, interestingly enough, he shows the personality of it where he says, and all languages. See, that's the thing nowadays. Is we've talked about this, that the, the, how uh, those other kingdoms, how they started integrating cultures. And to integrate a culture, you have to have the same languages. Everybody has the same languages. So I'm just, I'm thinking about heaven. <clears throat> it is going to be so fun to be able to communicate to everybody. Every one of us will be able to talk to one another and understand our life experiences without any uh, hindrances. Just imagine that. To be able to talk to somebody that was in the deepest part of Africa and we'll be able to relate. We'll talk. We'll be able to talk to somebody in the steppes of Russia. We'll talk to somebody from, from China, some of the, the believers in China, and we'll be able to relate without any hindrances. And what's even better for you and I? When he talks about languages, because often, many times, the kings didn't even speak the languages. I, I love uh, the, the, the British history. Is often somebody was king who didn't even speak English. That happened a few times. The, the, when you think of some of the kings where they spoke French, and that's all they spoke, but they would be the king of England. Hmm. Yay! It's like, how are you working that action? So that means every time you're having a discussion, you're having to talk through an intermediary. Somebody else would have to convey your instructions who was bilingual. So imagine today as we think about Jesus. And there's those that, that we talk about, well, if you want to hear God, read your Bible out loud. But imagine when the, the king of heaven Jesus will be able to have an unhindered conversation with us. I was thinking about this. I was challenged by this. Is if Jesus was to have a conversation with you, what do you think the first thing he would want to talk about? I was challenged on this because Somebody said so often we just he's gonna talk about my sin. He's gonna talk about how I'm failing. I was challenged by that. That is not what he's gonna talk about. He's gonna talk about, hey, there's Roel. I love you, Roel. You're the best guy I know. Mark. I love you, Mark. You're the best, best guy I know. And this is and, but the thing is, you both say, well, he just said that about the thing is, he's going to know specifically about you, and he's going to know about you, he's going to know about you, because he's going to know you, he's going to be able to talk specifically to you, to your very heart of heart, to what he loves about you, that you are only yourself, and you're not like anybody else. See, I can't, I can't even imagine that. That's why in my pretend conversation, I, I can only go so far. But Jesus, in his loving conversation, he is... He's like, me, me, me. He's like, but Jesus, I did this. He's like, what? I died for that. That's, that's done. That's done. I want to talk about you. Because I made you. And I love you. And that's, that's astounding. That's astounding. And amazing to think about. Amazing. So, and of course, everything I'm describing only positively applies to those who have trusted him as Savior. They will also apply negatively to those who have rejected him. 
Because Jesus will still be Lord over those who rejected him. And he will be able to enact the judgment on those who have rejected him. If you didn't want a savior, okay. And he will send them away. And he has the authority and power to do so. Sad that I have to mention that, but that's going to be the truth. So, this one who is like a son of man will exercise dominance and rule, yet he would be different in a key element compared to those other beasts. Remember this? He, that's what's happening. You have to remember the whole context of things. Daniel's seeing all these other beasts, all their rule and might and horror and things that they would smash and destroy and how powerful they would be. And yet, here, somebody else, like a son of man, will come and do something completely different. It says in Daniel, in verse 14, with this, and he says, And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. That's exciting. And what's interesting is Daniel already has been aware of this. Remember when he had the, the privilege of telling Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this statue that was gold, silver, bronze, and then iron were mixed with clay. And he saw all this. And then, but and then he saw something else happen. Something happened to that statue. Someone did something to all those kingdoms. Daniel saw it. First, he was giving a visual picture in Daniel chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. It says, as you looked, and he's talking about Nebuchadnezzar, what Nebuchadnezzar saw. So he's relating to Nebuchadnezzar his own dream. And he says, as you, Nebuchadnezzar, looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. Uncreated stone. Mm. And it struck the image, that statue that he saw, on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, and the bronze, and the silver, and the gold, all together, and all those other kingdoms. Remember, he said they were going to be around, but then uh, now they're not. He said they're broken in all the pieces and became like chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind just carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the enemy became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's exciting. Let's take a look. He gives an explicit interpretation about this too. In verse 44 and 45 of chapter 2, it says, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall, be, it, it shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw the stone that was cut from a mountain, by no human hand, and then it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. It occurs to me, even if I read, as I read this, we talk about, I have no idea what heaven would be like. Can I just, I'm here. And I have no idea what a culture would be that is only a culture influenced only by Jesus himself. Because he says all these other guys are going to get wiped out. All their influences, all their desires, all their want, all their conquering, everything they ever planned to be is going to be gone. And we will be under the sole influence of this one. Amen. And I just, I can't even imagine it to be in that spot to where my whole mind is only thinking the thoughts of Christ. Now it says, we were told by the scripture that I have the mind of Christ, but it's still a struggle. I'm still trying to think what Jesus would think. But imagine unhindered spiritual mind. What that would be. That's just it's amazing to think about. Amazing to think about. So he gives them this, this picture and everything that was going on. Gabriel told Mary about this too. So Mary got the whole, she got the whole synopsis also right at the beginning. Gabriel told Mary the very promise of Jesus in Luke 1 He says, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. 
That's why I'm sure when Mary saw him getting crucified, she's like, what is happening? It's all coming to an end. Gabriel just said it wouldn't come to an end. It's coming to an end right now. Look, it's coming to an end. He's dying. But you and I know it was not. So what's the implications of this prophetic promise? Kind of interesting when he talks about this everlasting dominion, everlasting kingdom. When we think about the Lord, think about our position and what it means to be have Jesus as Lord. He has an everlasting dominion. It means that all that he has conquered, all that he has conquered, not just the earth, but sin and death, all that he has conquered will remain conquered. It's not going to come back. It's not going to come back. It's not going to creep its head again. When, it, it, when it's done, when he takes over, it, it's done. That's why it says the last enemy to be thrown in the pit of hell is death and Hades. It'll be done. It'll be conquered. That's exciting. It's not like, oh, we're going to get there, and then it's all, we're going to have to do this, this kind of battle again. He's like, no, it's done. And he says he's going to have an everlasting kingdom. It means all who rule and reign with him will never be ruled and reigned by anyone else ever again. Ever again. Imagine a time when the enemy is not whispering rebellious to you. And that will be that day. When every thought is turned to love and service of our king. Just every thought. We'll never have to have somebody else try and say, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna steal you away. It'll be his everlasting kingdom. Jesus is the demonstration of the Father. All that the Father does, he does through the Son. And when we think about this idea of the Son of Man, I, I don't have this as the scriptures in, in, on my overhead. But in Psalm 80, the phrase Son of Man comes up. In Psalm 80, so make a reference of it, I'll let you look it up later. In Psalm 80, it's talking about Israel as in a spot. Things are going south for Israel, and they need help. They need a Savior. They need somebody to come save them. And you can see the plea when he says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, in verse 1, who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come save us. So he's like, here it is, the psalmist is just pleading, come, come do your business. He talks later in verse 4, he talks about the, the God of hosts. Verse 3 back there, he says, Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. He's like, so it's a plea. Somebody's going to do this. Oh, great shepherd, do this. How are you going to do this? And he gets to verse 17, when he has all sorts of things going south. He says, But let your hand be on the man of your right hand. The son of man who you made strong for yourself. So when he talks about this, some suggest that besides Daniel, that this person that's, that's going to come save them, this son of man, they're pleading for Jesus. They're pleading for this Messiah. So that when Jesus loved to call himself the son of man, not just referring to Daniel, he's like, I'm that guy. I'm that guy that's going to set your world that's ablaze back aright. When you think the enemy is done and had his way, he's in the fight. That's who he is. Father God, we just thank you for Daniel's vision of, of heaven. Seeing the Father and the Son. Father, thank you that you're, you're 
allowing the sun to show what you do and what you're about. And I just pray today that we would realize as believers that we're part of the dominating kingdom. This whole world thinks they're going to have their way. They think that they can live without God. They think they can pursue, pursue the rest of their imaginations without God. But that will all come to an end. Because someday there's going to be someone, the great mountain of God, that will smash all of what they thought they could do without God. Oh, glorious day. Father, I pray that we would understand that. I pray that our heart of hearts would chew on it. That we would realize who you are. And when we say Jesus is Lord, that he's our king, what that hope would mean for us. What it speaks to our heart. Father, I just thank you and praise you. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's praise God one more time.